Spicy110 said, Jake, you're an idiot. Why haven't you done a Q&A? How long has it been? And I was like, it's been years. Spicy110 is right. Let's do a Q&A. And I thought it would be really fun to do one about motorcycle maintenance. I can act like I know what I'm talking about a little bit. I asked on my Patreon for some questions for a Q&A video about maintenance. And before you cry to me going, why didn't you ask everybody? Why is it just the Patreons? A couple reasons. One, they're Patreons. They get a little bit of uh, preference there. Uh, two, if I had asked everybody in general, I would have gotten way too many to go through and properly answer. It would have been insane. And ultimately, the patrons are going to ask a lot of the same questions you guys would have asked anyway. The first question is nothing to do with motorcycle maintenance. Would you ever travel to Upper Michigan for an adventure ride? What's in Upper Michigan? Isn't that like the lake? This has nothing to do with maintenance, so <laughs> let's not spend any more time on that. Connor here said uh, he's an automotive mechanic. He wants to start getting into uh, motorcycle mechanics wants to know is there anything particularly needs this is this is a little hard for me then too because I'm not an automotive mechanic so I don't know like massively what the differences are but I've got a wide variety of hammers really only one like hard metally hammer I got a lot of dead blows little ball ping mallets I like to beat on things but pretend we're doing it a little more gently so yeah hammers Alexander is asking about uh, what kind of um, toolkit would I put together for doing maintenance while you're out on the road um, I actually just unloaded the tools I brought with me. This bike, the adventure bike when I built, has in the bar pad a lot of small tools. That thing is super cool, but six millimeters, something up to like, their kit went up to a 13. I switched the 13 to a 14. It had some other little uh, Allens and whatnot. Also, I brought a big set of channel locks. I know those are kind of a caveman tool, but they can also double as a hammer. It's a real big set. The axles require such a big tool that if you're out in the go, what I would bring with you is just, I, I brought a big adjustable, another caveman way of doing it, but reduces down on so much stuff. Obviously a bunch of zip ties. I had JB Quick, which also came into handy at one point. Uh, some kind of good tape, a tire patch repair kit. It's hard to carry so, so much with you because tools are heavy. So you got to kind of uh, go a little more caveman when you go on a trip like that. So yeah, those are the things I brought with me. Should do you well. A different Connor here is asking me, so what kind of required tools to start working, doing your own maintenance on your bike? And wouldn't mind even seeing a whole video about that. I, I could probably do a whole video on it. If you guys want a whole video on it, comment below. Let me know if you want to see an entire video about like a sort of starter tool kits. Matt, who was on the adventure trip with me, is asked in a very silly way how to get our bikes clean after going on our trip. Matt, our bikes will never be clean again after that trip. But I am gonna turn your silly question into an actual proper maintenance question. One of the things you probably should do after getting a bike that muddy, uh, and this is kind of why we hit that power washer before you come home, is you need to look at the places like the seals where things are moving in and out, that have got mud caked on them, up by the counter shaft, any mud up on them. Anything, like I said, with a seal and something moving against it, if it's just got tons of mud up against it and you just go hit the road, you're just gonna tear them up. Twice, I actually destroyed the counter shaft seal on my WR450 because mud had gotten behind the uh, the sprocket there, dried up, and then you know you go to ride the next time, it just tears it up. It's not just to make it look pretty, there's actually a good maintenance reason as to why you should do that. Matt wants to know, what is the dumbest mistake you've uh, you've witnessed? I did see one time, he had a Goldwing on a lift. He was bringing the Goldwing down and his rolly chair was under one of the corners. He didn't know that. So as it hit a point, suddenly hits that chair and it it toppled the whole thing over. You're like, <gasps> and you have this like second where you're like, I need to run over and do something. But luckily the smart part of my brain said, no, Jake. That's a Honda Goldwing up in the air. You can't catch that. <laughs> so we let it go. Surprisingly, the bike was fine. It was it was crazy. To rank the manufacturers in terms of reliability, ease of maintenance, performance, and personality. Performance, I don't think personality, that's such a tough question. And it's not very maintenance-y, so I'm gonna skip that part just because it's, it's been way too long on this otherwise. Anything from the Japanese four, the major Japanese four, is gonna be like top-notch stuff. The first shops I worked at was a Polaris and KTM dealership. The KTMs were finicky for sure, at least back then, but that was back in like 08. The Polarises, they had some horrible things about trying to work on them. Diffs front and rear, a transfer case, and all three of those I think took a different fluid. How one differential took a different fluid from the other differential was insane to me. They were such a pain to get to. There were so many grease fittings you had to try to check and yeah, man, they were so hard to get to, all of them. They really didn't think about that. Jeffrey is asking, what and when is the proper time to clean your chain? Is doing it too often bad for your chain? A lot of people like to put a mileage on this. It depends on a lot of factors. If you're cruising the streets in fair weather, I mean, it goes a lot. You can, you can get away with a lot longer versus the guy like what we did. I mean, you know, we were blasting on those, those dirt and sandy roads on that adventure trip. Usually I go around my supermoto. 
I'm playing around in silly, dirty places. You know, clean a clean chain is a happy chain. Someone told me that one time. It starts looking dirty. You start seeing little rust spots on it. You're not doing it enough then. Oh, I knew it was gonna come here. Uh, Scott's asking me a question about oil. <laughs> Let's know what's, what is my take on Rotella. I've used Rotella. I remember one of the shops I worked at, uh, we just had like Rotella was like our, like our premium oil that we always put in everything. I mean, a lot of the synthetics are pretty good. I've used uh, Ames oil in the past. I found on my WR it ran a little cooler when I ran Ames oil, but I haven't seen that to be as true in, in my other bikes. The newer bikes that, you know, they said use synthetics, just use a synthetic. I mean, honestly, I, a lot of times I get what's on sale. I will say, Bikes like my XR over there. That motor was, you know, developed probably the late 90s then. You know, synthetics were around back then, but they weren't as common. And what I found with that bike is if I put full synthetic in it, it tends to burn it a little. Not at a really fast rate, but it burns a little bit. You can use Rotella if you want. You can use whatever. It's <laughs> they're all pretty good. How do you tell if you're changing your oil too soon or too late? There's a manufacturer recommendation, which is honestly a pretty good one. You can you know, I always tell people, just try not to go beyond that. A lot of times I do it earlier on my bikes. It's hard to look at it like, oh, look how black it looks. People like to do that. People like to take their fingers in and go, hmm, hmm. You know, you feel, if you can feel particulates in there, I wonder if you have an oil filter in there. Like that oil filter is gonna be way more precise and pull fine stuff out than you'd be able to detect with your fingers. My XR has got one of those magnetic oil drain bolts on it. And people like to pull us out and, and spell oh, how much metal. You're always gonna have some metal. You always, it's, it, engines are gonna lose a little bit of metal, unfortunately, you know, they don't, they don't last forever. That's why you eventually have to rebuild them. Usually when you see those little fibers in there, if you actually grab them and like move them, they're, they're tiny, you're tiny little things. They've just built up into like a little, a little, looks like a little shaving of metal on there. So Alex has asked me to explain the science of the hard break-in. Here's the thing, I've done an entire video. I've done several about this, but I did one a few years ago. So go watch that video if you really wanna see that. Kind of a long subject, and I go into it a lot in that video. Chris has asked, uh, how do you know when you need to do maintenance on uh, wheel bearings and brakes? Well, with wheel bearings, and this is true of any bearing, what you like to do, and this is not very scientific, but anytime you have access to a bearing where you pulled the wheel off or a, a linkage piece out or, or uh, like a clutch basket off, there's a bearing, you know, you, what you're gonna do is you're gonna stick your finger in it and go, and it'll decide whether it feels good or not. Uh, good is that it doesn't feel notchy or have like a bunch of play and movement in it. You know, it just has that nice, consistent feel. Anything other than that's not good. The cool thing with motorcycles, you can see the pads. You can like always kind of look down there at them and you can see you know, how thick they are. But in my experience, you never get all the way through the pad before the brakes just start kind of being crap. You know, I don't know if they just get contaminated or what. It's just been my experience. I mean, they, they last a good while. It's just, they don't start squeaking like car brakes or anything. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. Uh, Mr. Spicy110 himself has asked, what tool would you say is invaluable? Like once you've used one, you could not do without. It's back there. The pneumatic brake bleeder. You don't have to have a huge compressor. I don't think mine's like 17 gallons and it's, it's not a real one, but you, I don't think it would work with those little pancake ones. Yes, the pneumatic brake bleeder you know, the brake vacuum, basically. I feel like when I adjust my chain, by the time I tighten everything back up, the chain ends up being too tight or too loose. What am I doing wrong? Uh, and Thomas here said, jab a rag between the chain and the rear sprocket to hold the rear axle in place. That's actually a great suggestion. Yes, do what he said. When you put a chain there and you, you roll the tire back and it sucks the rag a little bit up into the chain. I mean, you don't, you don't have to like cram it in there just a little bit. It hunks the, the tire up good because that might be what it is. You might just be getting a little bit off there. I, I've seen plenty of times where people tighten up a chain and you go, ah, it's a pinch too tight. And they go, eh, it'll work it out. Err on the side of being a pinch loose than being a pinch tight. Like if you just are chasing between the two and you're going nuts, a little loose, don't, don't go tight. Thomas here says he's been fighting his Z1000's transmission for a while now. Don't fight your transmission. The gear shifter doesn't, doesn't always want to go back into the neutral position after uh, I shift gears from the lower RPMs unless I push it back into the middle with my foot. Ooh, clutch engages, disengages, fine, doesn't slip. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue with your clutch. What it sounds like to me is it probably does have something to do with the linkage, but not the linkage on the outside of the bike, the one inside the bike. Uh, you can bend that stuff pretty easy. And it would make sense too, you're saying it's it's at higher RPMs, it's not a problem, because probably the slight vibrations are enough to get things, if there's something kind of sticking or rubbing, so if there's a friction point, something tight, that's what it makes me think. It makes me think something like the little, what they call it, the manufacturer's got a different name, a little spinning, doing the little ratchety thing that spins a shift drum. If your shifter's acting up, don't stomp it, don't, you know, you see people do that, I go, oh God, because you can bend stuff pretty easy in there, you'd be surprised. You have to pull one of the entire cases off, the side case, usually it's on the clutch side, just look it up, 
and you might have to remove the clutch basket, then usually you can get to the linkage. It's usually kind of underneath there. I guess it's something maybe bent or tweaked in there. Ian says, my old 99 Magna, well, if you have a Magna, they're all old, has some carb issues. It really stumbles at cracked throttle and, and will really choke if you pin it. But it picks back up after second. Does that sound more like a slide, diaphragm, needle, uh, idle jet, blah, blah, blah. One of those, yeah, it's definitely carb related, carb, carb related. related. I know the words, ask me things. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, if it was me, I would just pull the whole things out, give them a hell of a good cleaning, carb cleaner through all the holes, and then compress air through the same holes, and do it multiple times so you're really satisfied that everything's clean. Look at the condition of all the rubber and O-ring parts and all this, you may want to need to get a rebuild kit for those carburetors. Those don't typically break the bank. And the good thing is, at the end of the day, a carburetor, you know, there, it's a chunk of aluminum with a lot of holes going through it. When you have them together, a CV carburetor, you can kind of push the diaphragm up and watch kind of, you go to the dropping of it, you can kind of, and because you have multiple ones, you can kind of gauge them if you think there's an issue with those. And if you did think there was an issue, I'd just replace all the slides just to be safe. And then sync them, get them nice and synced up, it'll run like a top. What is the most important uh, thing for maintaining a bike to get the longevity out of your bike? It's gonna sound really boring, but in something I'm sure you already know. Let your bike warm up, change the oil. Leon wants to know when is me and Dan gonna do another dual vlog in Walmart? That has nothing to do with maintenance, but it's a great question. I don't know, that was a hilarious video for some reason. I don't know why me and Dan walking around Walmart was as funny as it was, but it was. I don't know, figure that out. <laughs> Matt, this is a good question. What should you check after a drop? Well, the first thing you gonna do is you wanna pick the bike up and make sure the fluids are still in it. It's easy to pop a you know, case on the side of the bike. It's easy to uh, even pop a radiator if you land on something uneven. I've seen it uh, literally just like a slow drop over hit on the curb. Look look for glass from your mirror. If you smashed a mirror, try to clean that up. Make sure your throttle still moves freely. That's a, that's actually quite important. I have seen that plenty of times where someone drops the bike over, they have a bar end or a hand guard and it pushes it in, uh, which is why when you set that stuff up to begin with, you really need to make sure you have a little bit of a gap between your throttle tube and the end of the bar there. Thomas wants to know, can we get a shim type vowel tutorial? Um, yeah, it's actually funny. I mean, I did the I did the vowels on the XR, but those were the tappet types. And I've done several videos where I've actually checked uh, vowels on bikes that have shims, but I just got lucky. I've never had to actually do it when I was recording a video. If I don't record it, of course I'll have to do it. I mean, all I can tell you is I'll keep, I'll keep uh, checking vowels and eventually I'll have to do one where I have to actually shim some vowels and you can see that. Get to do math and stuff. How often you should run a bike that isn't being used regularly? Well, if it's a DRZ, you can't let it sit more than two days. <laughs> the DRZ what I'm talking about. There's a lot of bikes out there that cannot sit long. They will just kill the battery. Uh, in that case, I suggest you get a battery tender little plug-in thing, uh, keep it topped up. But I mean, you know, short of like a charging issue, I'd like to say once a month at least, but you can probably go a little longer. Let them get to temperature do a little lap, get a little on it at one point, you, know, you gotta clear them out, right? Ah, oh, Nerb from Down Under wants to know, what parts do you use a torque wrench on and what parts do you do uh, by feel? This is something I've gotten crap for. Let me just say this to start with. You gotta do with what you're comfortable with. If you really like to just torque everything and have those torque specs, then just, you do that. You know, get a good standard torque wrench, get one of the little small ones, you know, for the, the smaller stuff that are calibrated for that. Torque every single bolt. There is a spec for basically every bolt on your bike. So yeah, myself personally, just cause I've done a lot of it, a lot of the, even the little engine bolts, like the you know, little small eight, I feel like an eight, 10 millimeter bolt, you know, I just, and you guys have seen me in the videos, I'm just not holding the wrench down at the bottom. I'm using a small, a little small ratchet, and, you know, just holding it. Usually the, the thing's coming out between my fingers. So I'm, I'm really not putting much torque on it. I've just developed a pretty good feel for it. And if you go work, in a shop, not to say that everybody in every shop would be this way. Um, I'm sure you go to like, you know, a BMW shop in Germany and they're probably busting a torque wrench out for every little thing. But you know, most of the shops I've worked at, people I've worked around, they're not busting a torque wrench out for all the tiny little things. Um, that's just people that do all the time. You just get a kind of a good feel for it. Even the oil drain bolts. I, I don't think I've ever taken a torque wrench to one of those. You know, I just know that feel, you know, you gotta get that new crush wash. You gotta give it a little, you know, get a little pinch in there. Uh, things I use them on, any of the main, like the big axles, front rear axle, swing arm axle, uh, the counter shaft, counter shaft nut. Honestly, with almost all those two, what I always find is what I think is tight is never tight enough. Like if I just took it went and made it tight, like the breaker bar, then went and checked it with the torque wrench, I'm usually way off. So that's a good, it's a good reason for me that I need to use them on the bigger stuff like that. Anything basically bigger. Y'all like my silly sword I've been playing with? 
this is an authentic sword from China. <laughs> I thought that was going to get thrown away. I thought it was funny to, to have. And so now I have it. What do you think? Um, so there you go. That, we could go on and on, uh, but I don't want to make this video hours and hours long. I think we've gotten some good stuff in there. You guys on Patreon are now four videos ahead of everybody else. I hope, I hope you feel like it's worth it at this point. That, that's not normal, uh, but you know, but hey, if you're not on Patreon, join Patreon. <laughs> it's $1. Uh, a video or you can set it to be just one dollar a month by adding a cap let me know what you may want to hear about in the next q a videos if we or if you don't even want to see me you hate it and you hate the q a video let me know um <laughs> otherwise i'm going to uh, uh put this sword down before i do something dumb with it like jab it through the ceiling or cut my foot off and uh, i'll see y'all in the next video Bye bye <laughs>